Um, we're here at uh, Shaker High School in Latham, New York, uh, doing an interview as part of the Veterans uh, Oral History Project. Uh, this one uh, sponsored by the Library of Congress and also jointly sponsored by Shaker High School and the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, I'm here with Rich Snyder. Rich, uh, would you uh, tell us uh, where, first tell me, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist and what branch of service were you? I enlisted in the Air Force, right in Albany, in uh, actually January of 1952, but uh, they had no openings at that time and I actually went to basic training in the first day of September Wow! in that year and ended up a long ways away, went all the way to Sampson Air Force Base. That's, that's where? Lake, Ge Lake uh, just south of Geneva, New York on Finger Lakes. Wow. Which was a real experience because the Navy had had that base for three years and every winter they had 70 to 80 percent of their personnel that were supposed to be training in the hospital with pneumonia because it's so blasted cold and damp on the lake. What's well, not so good? Um, now that was during Korea. Yes, it yes, was. It, it seems surprising that they didn't have openings. <laughs> you would, well, they didn't. Yeah. Uh, that particular time, I think it was, they just had so many people that were volunteering, volunteering for the Air Force that they had to space them out a little bit because they could only get the training just so fast. Once you, so you went through training in Samson and then where from, where did you go from Samson? Took another long trip. We went to Rome, Rome, New York. Ended up in a uh, very small outfit. Uh, Rome was a radar developing center and there were uh, just in the process of getting the bugs out of ground contour radar and all we did was we had three B-25s in the outfit and we flew the three B-25s against the radar testing units every day, five days a week. And I ended up as a flight engineer, one of the 25s. And that lasted for almost a year. When the program ended, they scrapped B-25s because they were overdue to go to the boneyard out in Arizona. They transferred me to a, the military police squadron because at the time I was studying clinical criminology and social science with the University in Washington and ended up working in the stockade there for a few years, got transferred from there to Anchorage, Alaska with the same job. When I got there, it was just my lucky week, I guess. Uh, they had requested one criminologist to work for that area and somebody in their brilliant decisions decided one was enough, so let's make it ten. So we ended up on a base that didn't have 10,000 people and one position, so nine of us had to leave. <laughs> I ended up transferring into a rescue unit up there. The background of 25s, we worked ground and air rescue all over Alaska. And supposed to be there for three years, ended up staying there two. Got reassigned to Mitchell Field, Long Island, which is now closed. They seem to close every place, right? That's right, been there or something. I don't know. Maybe it's me, maybe somebody else. Spent two years there, two and a half years. They closed that and transferred me to McGuire in New Jersey. And I spent a little over a year there working with the Army in the Army stockade as an Air Force criminologist and decided that doesn't work at all. And had a discussion with the people in the Army and, and a disagreement followed. I saw other work. Went to school to be a loadmaster, and I was Shepherd. Got out of there. Shepherd is where Rich? Wichita Falls, Texas. It's one of the training bases where they have, you know, continuous running 
training classes, four or five different types of training. From there, back to McGuire, believe it or not, to a, at that time, KC-135 squadron, or C-135 squadron. And uh, since I had been there before and had a disagreement with the Army, right across the fence, they decided they would leave me someplace else, so they immediately transferred me to Evreux, France. Evreux had C-130s. C-130s, a good airplane. It gets you in places that you shouldn't be, which is really not good sometimes. But you get quite a few experiences on those, because you always end up on the wrong side of the fence, or the wrong side of the world, or the wrong side of the job, however you put it. Then, Rich, the C-130, was it a fairly new plane at that point? C-130s were originally built, uh, went into production in 53. Uh, the first airplanes, actually, squadrons of them were out on the line being used in 1955. And I got to Evero early in the spring of 1963. So still a relatively new plane. What was your, what was your job on the plane? Loadmaster. You were a loadmaster yeah. on the plane. So what'd you do in France? <laughs> Spent a little time there. That was just a, a base that the, the 130s used. The good part of it was it was only 60 miles north of Paris. But we spent most of our time either someplace along the Russian border in Europe or in the Mediterranean or even as we used to run as far east as India. We had a couple of exercises that they were running out of New Delhi, India. One of those was uh, they were building, the Indian government was building a, an airport and had to build the runways and the whole thing right from dirt ground on a mountain side, about 17,000 foot altitude on the border of China. And we had Two C-130s from our outfit were there all the time, and the crews would rotate in, work for two weeks, and come back out and do something else for a couple of months, and then go back down, work for two weeks down there. But they would haul all the supplies, everything they needed to build that complete airport. The, what was the C-130's prime? What's its what's its primary purpose or, or capacity? Primary purpose is medium-range transport to places that other airplanes can't get. Uh, if they require a short runway, even with a fully loaded airplane, you can get off of a runway that's 2,000, 3,000 feet long and land on the same thing. And you can land in dirt, gravel. It doesn't have to be a finished runway. It's a, classified as an assault air, airplane. Its primary use in the beginning was to transport uh, airborne troops and their equipment, designed basically for that. But they used it for everything. We used air, airdrop equipment in places that were unquestionable with another airplane. We dropped a full-size diesel road grader to a construction job to the top of a mountain in Pakistan early in 1964. I wasn't on the actual mission, but some our squatter had that mission for continue with his road building project because the one they had up there fell off a cliff. They had to get a replacement for it. But it's primarily an assault airplane and it's primarily used for tactical use, not just for transport use. What'd you have for a crew on that plane, Rich? Five people. You had a pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, a flight engineer, and a loadmaster. So it's a pretty small crew for playing that size. Uh, back in those days, yes. Nowadays, they fly the, the same airplane. They just fly the new C-17. It only has a three-man crew, but it's all electronic. Yeah. But it can't do what the 130s used to do. And, the, and there's still C-130s in use today. <laughs> They're still building. They're into the... H models, they have H models right here at Stratton. And they work, the, as everybody knows, the South Pole and Alaska, if they're needed up there. Uh, they're equipped with skis specifically for that operation. 
they still have regular transport units with 130s, but they're used primarily, again, in emergency missions and other military support missions. For the, the Marine Corps uses them, the Navy uses them, the Navy has quite a few of them used for refueling aircraft for fighters. Because believe it or not, in case of an emergency, they can land a C-130 on a carrier. They don't do it as a practice, but it is in emergencies they can't do that. So, let me go back for a minute. You were, you enlisted in 53. 52. 52. Mm -hmm. It's now 69, and you're in France. Now 63. 63 in France, okay. Um, how long were you in France? Well, the French government threw us out the 1st of June, 1964. <laughs> said they didn't want us over there anymore, so we moved back to Columbus, Ohio. All the airplanes, all the personnel. At which time the, they were getting into things like preliminaries for Vietnam and whatnot. And uh, six months after I arrived there, all three of the squadrons arrived there, they formed a combat crew training wing under the same wing that controlled the squadrons and they took all the in, top instructors out of all the different squadrons and put them in the training wing. So from then until 1968 I worked there as an instructor, loadmaster instructor. And what we did is we took crew members from other airplanes including bombers, transports and whatnot, or airplanes that were phasing out. So SAC was getting rid of a lot of pilots at that time because they were changing over from the big bombers to the jet bombers and fewer crew people, fewer airplanes. And uh, we got a lot of people from SAC, we got from other flying outfits or people brand new right out of school and they all got mixed. And we tried to train a crew as a crew team so they would work together because in assault work or combat work, it has to be a team operation one mistake can cause everybody's life. So you did that in uh, from about the end until of 64 until 68. 68 they sent me to Southeast Asia to do what I was teaching because they were having a lot of problems over there. That was when they were starting the pullback of the American soldiers out of Vietnam and they needed be able to do emergency evacuations, uh, high speed supply, resupply to the people that were on the front lines and whatnot while they moved back. Because anytime you're retreating, let's say that's about the best word for it, uh, you're vulnerable because you have fewer people available. And usually they have more people opposing you. So I spent from 68 to uh, the middle of 69, right in Vietnam. Actually a sign on the island of Taiwan. They put us there because it was safer for the airplanes, safer for the crews, and they could keep us there for a longer period of time. So, so did you actually fly out of Taiwan? We'd fly out of Taiwan and either go to Cameron Bay or Tuiwa or Bangkok, or Saigon, and work from one of those bases, or sometimes we'd hit them all on, within two or three weeks' time, until you ran out of flying time. You were allowed 120 hours a month actual flying time, and usually by the 20th or 21st of the month, we would be out of flying time. And then they'd ferry us back to Taiwan, leave us there until the first or the second of the month, and send us back in Vietnam again. So what, what kinds of missions were you working, Rich? Primarily emergency resupply, a few of them that were classified that we don't talk about yet. It's got to be, I think, 50 years or something, I don't know. <laughs> but some, some of them nobody wants to talk about. But uh, we'd fly emergency resupply missions going in early in the morning, so we'd be over the, the supply zone where we were going at daybreak. 
and then from there back we do emergency medevac at a dirt fields, concrete fields, whatever, wherever we had to go to get them. Helicopters would bring them into a big landing zone, what they called, we called it a dirt field because that's all it was, somebody's meadow on a mountainside, and we'd land and pick them up and medevac the injured out to Cameron and they'd be buried over to the hospital ship from there. What um, were there in that time frame? Were there particular missions that stand out in your mind more than others? Yes. One of them was like a, a very slow. I wasn't on it. Again, I missed all the excitement, thank goodness. But uh, one of the C 130s took some bad fire and uh, many holes in the airplane. The airplane actually caught fire at the tail section and was burning forward, burning the insulation and wearing out of it. But they got it back to Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay had a very large runway and it's on an island off the coast and the runway was almost perfectly north and south of your land from either end of it and it's like 14,000 feet long and it's all white sand on both sides of the concrete. And they landed with that burning airplane and landed it in the sand rather than on the concrete so it wouldn't burn anything else and it'd be off the runway, just leave the wheels up. And it was a good airplane to do that with. You could do it very easily and survive. And the airplane slid to a stop and it's a ball of fire and the overhead hatch opens and out comes a very small, very short, just barely made it into service, five foot two loadmaster bounced up out of the hatch and ran down the wing and jumped off the end of the wing, but he ran the wrong way. The wing he should have ran down was down on the ground. He jumped off, he was about 15 feet in the air, hit the sand and took off like a cartoon. A little cloud of dust came up around him and he's off and running. The rest of the crew walked down the stairs, opened the door and stepped out on the ground like they're supposed to. But if it had, hadn't been a dangerous situation, it was at the time it was extremely funny. Everybody was falling down laughing about it. About it, but we lost an airplane. Yeah. Didn't lose any crew people or anything. We just did lose an airplane. Was it typical in those missions? And and was it? Were you ever in that situation where where the plane where your plane was under fire? Oh, many times. Uh, once we took three rounds to the tail section, but there was nobody back there. And it wasn't. It didn't hit anything vital. So we went on normal operations. A uh, good friend of mine that I knew from it when we first got in France, who was one of the crew chiefs, got to be upgraded to a flight engineer, was killed evacuating off Shaw Valley during the Tet Offensive. He was originally from uh, Johnstown, right here. Luckily, I survived the whole deal. Because you guys were, I mean, those planes weren't armed at all, correct? No. No armament whatsoever. We did have uh, armor plating under all the seats in the airplane, except the Loadmasters. <laughs> oh, that couldn't have been a real comfortable feeling. <laughs> and that was because, why? Because the Loadmaster didn't have a seat. Oh, okay. There's seats down both sides of the airplane in the back. But if you get under fire, uh, I used to go jump in the, the engineer's lap. <laughs> Beat up in the shield. Because you had to be in the cockpit for a shield. Actually, that's just a joke. You used to go stand behind the engineer's seat. But uh, the only armor plating in it is underneath the seats in the cockpit. But it was interesting. <clears throat> because you had to be landing in some pretty hot areas when oh, you're yeah. doing the evacuation, no? If you're doing medevac, that was the worst. If you're going if you're going in for resupply, you go in at uh, 125 miles an hour, right on the treetops, you drop down to three feet off the ground and extract 40,000 pounds of equipment, ammunition, food, medical supplies, whatever you needed for that particular run. 
and you do that at 125 miles an hour. So you literally, you've got some way of releasing it, and it just yes. You fly over the field, the navigator calls extract. The extraction ship goes out, and the load goes out on pallets and slides to a stop. If you do it right, that's the reason I was sent over there because they weren't doing it right. It was all hitting in the ground too early, or from too high or too low. They were losing a lot of equipment that they didn't get the people needed very badly. So some of those drop zones had to also be pretty high, uh, or not? Yeah, some of them were. Uh, even some of the airfields, they'd set up on a mountain with a rocket launcher and wait for an airplane to stop. And they would have a whole bunch of rockets lined up and have each one up for a section of the airfield. So if the airplane stopped and stayed there for a minute, they would launch two-inch rockets in on it. And you usually get pretty close. Sometimes they got a few up. But as long as you didn't stop, they wouldn't fire on you because they knew they couldn't hit you. So what we would do, we'd make the extraction run going in the morning. You'd finish with that, just go up and orbit around for a while and find out where they had any, they had to be medevaced out that we could get to. And we would land either on the dirt or on a landing field and they would bring them out on the hood of the Jeeps on you know, regular army stretchers and drive right up against the back of the airplane. And we'd slide them off onto the off the hood of the Jeep onto the ramp of the airplane and they'd take off for the bushes again with the Jeep and we'd close the door and leave. Do that at about fifteen or twenty miles an hour. Really? Oh, if so you didn't you, stop, they you, wouldn't shoot at you because they knew they couldn't hit you. So we now, kept kept them busy. When, when you did that, did you take medical personnel? Did medical personnel go with the... We normally would have either a doctor or a nurse on board, either one, or a physician's assistant, possibly. But we'd have some medical people on board, but some mornings we'd pick up 15, 20, and you'd have one doctor or one nurse or one doctor and nurse, and that would be all. Because oh. we'd go in with full load cargo, so you didn't have any place for them to ride. Would you, what did you have, what was your capacity for, for medevac? How many people did you take? We could, we could take uh, 32 in stretchers and uh, 28 side seats that were walking wounded. But you never go out of there full, of course. You'd have to land to be on the ground for an hour to load that many injured people aboard. But we'd pick up two or three here, two or three there. Sometimes, like I said, on a runway, sometimes not. But it's a lot better than it was in World War II. A lot of people that, uh, if it hadn't been for the helicopters and the medevac airplanes, a lot of people would have died in Vietnam that didn't. There's a lot of them alive that would have if they hadn't been able to get them out of the jungle. What, um, what were living conditions like for, for you while you were stationed? Well, we were in Vietnam. Yeah. Well, if we were in Taiwan, if we were back at, at the base in Taiwan, which is also a top secret Chinese fighter base, so we don't talk about that either. Uh, the in country, what we everybody call it in country, is in actually in Vietnam itself. Even in Cameron, he lived in a Quonset hut. And can you, you imagine how it how would be if you go outside right now and walked into a steel roof Quonset hut? No air conditioning, just about maybe three foot of wire caging around the bottom of it for the air to go to. That's what we slept in. We flu nights slept there days sometimes. Not a friendly atmosphere. No. Beautiful country. Really? Yeah. Cameron Bay itself would, would have made probably the world's best summer resort. At pure white sand beach, you could walk out into the bay. 500 feet before the water would get up to your neck on this soft sand beach. Walk along, look down the water, see the little fish swim around your feet and whatnot. And it was just ridiculous to have that whole island of Cameron, a war zone. Was it, was it a fairly safe place for the crews and the planes at least? At Cameron was, but that's the only one. Uh, Saigon, Saigon got uh, raided with assault teams probably five nights a week. And uh, 
all the other fields. Tuiwa was out on the coast. It was uh, just happened to be a natural point where they could put a pipeline in for the tankers for refueling airplanes. Problem was, uh, five to 15 miles in every direction were mountains. You were sitting in a little valley that was cleared out and they could shoot at you from any of the hills around it. And they did constantly shoot at it. Or they'd have what they call satchel teams come in with uh, bomb in a bag. That's the reason they call them satchel teams. And in the bag would be a uh, explosive unit with a trigger with a string on it, and they would throw it at you. And when they threw it at you, they had the lanyard around their wrist, and you had 15 to 20 seconds from the time they let go of it, and it would go off. We were in Tuiwa one night because we couldn't get back to Cameron, and our airplane was satchel charged. The problem was the crew chief and I were sleeping on a ramp in the back of the airplane, and the satchel charge hit him. He re re rolled over out of his sleeping bag, picked it up and threw it at him. Well, the two guys that threw it in the airplane ended up wearing it. So, yeah. a little close. just a slight payback. Yeah, it's a little close. <laughs> but they didn't get, a, didn't get our airplane. But they could have got us. This is easy. So, how late into the into uh, the war were you there in Vietnam? I left out of there in August '69, and uh, the, I think they finally pulled everybody out of Saigon. The last people to come out was in '70 or '71. So I think it's '70. Yeah. Can't remember that. So you were there for a good chunk of it, though. Yeah, I was there for actually 16 and a half, seven, almost 17 months. Um, and while you were there, did, did you or your unit get any commendations or awards? Yeah, quite a few of them. Uh, every, every member of the flying team was awarded an air medal which is normally reserved for pilots in combat, but even the engineers and boatmasters got an air medal for that. Which is, you know, as medals go, it's pretty far down the list, but it's still, I think the, the medal that I have that I feel the best about is I have five expeditionary medals, which is, in a combat area, under fire, with the first or second airplane, expeditionary airplanes, into a combat zone. So, <laughs> when did you get those and why did you get those? Well, the first one was uh, we evacuated the only airplane to get into Dutch West Africa during the rebellion, and we evacuated all the Dutch nationals out of Dutch West Africa during the rebellion and, and ended up taking machine gun rounds through the right wing on takeoff. And an airplane is supposed to have a maximum of 97 people on board. We came out of there with 306. That's quite a job. Now, when was that, Rich? What, what year was that? 64. 63. 63. Okay. Or, yeah. Around late '63, early '64, it was in the middle of the winter. So, okay, that was the first one. Uh, the second one was for the mission in India, flying stuff up into the mountains. That was kind of a uh, a weird place to fly. You might say the mountains are so close together when we first started the operation in order to land on this dirt field that they had for us to use. That was just a bulldozer track. Uh, you had to fly in sideways, so the airplane was wow. vertical wings because the pass between the two mountains wasn't wide enough to get through with them down flat. So they got a dynamite team up there and blew the tops or the sides of the mountain out to give us more clearance. The, let's see. I was the first airplane in 
to Sofia, Bulgaria in 1964. They had an earthquake down there, January 64, I think January, February. And we were the first airplane into Sofia, Bulgaria, which is a communist held, Russian held territory. And someone I forgot to tell them we were going. Oh, we landed on an army, Russian army airfield without permission. <laughs> That's a problem. That got interesting. We <laughs> picked up another expeditionary medal for that. What we were doing is transporting a medical team from Ryan, Maine, which is in Frankfurt, Germany, down there because there was not a hospital to take care of the injured people within 500 miles. The one that was in the city had burned down or something been destroyed for some reason or something. They did not have a hospital there. They had many, many injured people. So they took a complete field hospital from Ryan, Maine, down to Sofia, Sofia, and actually went, I think, 20 or 30 miles south to where the earthquake uh, actually epicenter where most of the people that were injured set it up there. Okay, that's number three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was the first airplane to land in the uh, Dominican Republic. They're an uprising down there. First air crew to land down there. We were actually flying into Charleston, South Carolina, landed on another mission. And as soon as we landed, they said, uh, your mission has been changed. You're going to such and such an airport. I don't even remember the name of it in the uh, Dominican Republic with a Army Air Force combined team to set up a, a receiving station for the actual Army people that were going down there. And the only place that was safe was the airport. So we got there, then they tried to take that over too. I, I flew many, many missions up and down the Berlin corridor from Ryan, Maine to, to Berlin. So then, okay, so now you're up to the last one, the fifth one. Well, that was, that was kind of a strange one. That one I don't talk about. Where in the world was it? Tell us that much. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway between uh, Vietnam and actually Cambodia, we made a landing in Cambodia. Dark at night, stayed there for about 30 seconds at a standstill and left. Picking some people up. So, we're now to 1969. Well, they sent me back to the place that I love most dearly in the world, McGuire Air Force Base. <laughs> they had C-141s. The, they didn't send me back there for that. Seems like the McGuire had. Uh, shipped all their people out. They had security clearances and the 18 squadron had the highest security clearance they had in the whole squadron was secret. And they had a whole safe full of top secret war plans and couldn't do anything with it. And uh, they had a new squadron commander was assigned. He got there and found out that he couldn't be more than 30 minutes from the base because he was the only one that could open the safe in case of an emergency. The only one that could brief air crews for new nuclear hauling, what would it call it, nuclear overflight to any parts of the world because you had to have somebody with top secret clearance to brief the crew before they could even leave McGuire. And I was an unlucky recipient of the fact that they needed somebody with a top secret clearance. I landed in Trappist coming out of Taiwan. 
and uh, somebody met me and asked me if I was so-and-so, and I told them, yes, I was. And they said, well, your orders have been changed. We'll mail them to you. Just go on home. Here's your paperwork. You'll get them in the mail. And I received orders in the mail to go to McGuire. And I received them uh, about three weeks after I was supposed to have reported originally to, to Charleston. So I had another three weeks off. And I went to McGuire. And the commander was a full colonel. And he, I walked into his office and reported to him and said, Colonel, I wasn't supposed to be here. I don't plan on staying. So why was I brought here? And then he explained it to me. And I ended up staying here for three years until I retired. So you retired in the first day of September 1972, with 20 years and one day <laughs> active duty. <laughs> and at that point, did you did you uh, get out completely? Did you do reserves, air guard, anything like that? You got out, right? I got out completely. Two weeks before I was supposed to retire, I was having a friend on over an airplane and had a chain binder break and it hit me right in the face. And it was the last chain on a heavy-duty six-by chain down the floor, an airplane. And it picked me up off the floor, threw me about 10 feet against the wall. Broke my bottom jaw, relieved me about half of my teeth, gave me a terrible headache. So you decided that was enough? Yeah, well, they said that I probably wouldn't be able to fly again because it would be two years for my face sealed up completely and whatnot. And uh, they don't allow you to fly if you have open areas and uh, sinus cavities or anything like that, or teeth that haven't been replaced, because that will cause you severe pain from being at altitude. So you retired and with 20 years. And what, what rank were you at when you retired, Richard? Master Sergeant. And it was a good 20 years. Yeah, as the military goes, it wasn't dull. It wasn't dull. So now, the other part we left out along this whole thing is, <clears throat> somewhere in there you got married. Well, I got married two years after I was in the Air Force. Went to the Air Force, first of September. Got married in 20th of June, two years later. And sometimes I think she thinks she made a mistake. <laughs> So by my math, you guys just celebrated your 50th wedding. 48. 48. Okay, yeah, because you said two years later. Right, right, yeah. Uh, and then you had a couple kids along the way. Four. Still have three of them. The oldest one was born with a heart condition. The doctor said he was going to live to be two maximum. And he lived to be 34 and enjoyed life as best he could. That's correct. When he actually passed away, he had a heart attack. They had expected that for 32 years. And uh, he was playing a pinball machine in a bowling alley because he was bowling in a bowling tournament. <laughs> <laughs> for somebody that was supposed to be ha handicapped, he did pretty good. No okay. And then uh, you had two boys and a girl. Now, and it's interesting that your daughter has kind of <laughs> <laughs> taken the lead, hasn't she? Well, yes and no. The oldest boy is a now supervisor in the Civilian Aircraft Rehab Center. The guy out of the Air Force at Warren Robins, Georgia walked across the field and went to work the next day. And he is a supervisor in a wing fabrication unit. They fabricate, fabricate uh, wings for fighter planes of all types. And they're all composite units. There's no rivets or anything in them. They're absolutely smooth on the outside. Son number two is an aircraft design engineer. Just this past fall, or not this past spring actually, he spent three months in oh, one of those little places over there. Uh, 
forgot what. But uh, he works for Hamilton Standard as a design engineer for aircraft parts and components. And Darlene is a major in the Air Force, in Air Force Intelligence, who is now the Wing Executive Officer at Fairchild Reserve Base in Washington State. And, and received a pretty significant award yeah. recently. Yeah, the Intelligence Officer, Field Grade Officer of the Year for Worldwide Intelligence. Very cool. Very proud of her. So all the kids have somehow stayed connected <laughs> to Dad's now, Air Force experience. Yes and no. The only one that wasn't in the military was Scott. And uh, he went to Potsdam here in Northern New York. I was an honor graduate and I went to work within three months with Hamilton Standard, which is uh, United Technologies Incorporated. Five different companies unified in aircraft construction. Now, even uh, joined up with Lockheed and whatnot but, uh, for different, different types of jobs. So, if you so, so all this is happening along the way. Uh, so if you retired, then what? I worked different jobs for about four or five years. Really wasn't interested in working, but I had to do something. Had to, couldn't, couldn't stand to be bored sitting around the house. Finally went to work at the communication center. They were just building a communication center in Greene County. It had dispatchers, two dispatchers that worked out of the jail down there, but uh, that was intermittent, and if they were busy doing something else, they never answered the radio, so they never had a communication center in there. For the whole county, everybody had their own little private communications. They made a county-wide communication system for the county, and I was one of the first people that went to work for it, other than the two that had worked part-time during the day, and got it operational. And now they dispatch all the fire departments, all the rescue squads, the sheriff's department, and all the local police units in the county from one dispatch center. And, and how long did you do that? Twelve and a half years. That was interesting. That's almost like flying. It's hours and hours of total boredom interrupted by moments of stark terror. 50% of the time when he answered a telephone or someone on the other end, it's in a total state of panic, screaming, and you can't even understand him. That's an interesting job. Stress-wise, it's terrible. You have to walk out of there every day and leave the job behind you, or you don't survive. Um, and and. And then ultimately you retired from that too. Yes, finally one. And so you've been retired since then. I've been retired since the first day of November, 1991. I think it was about the third uh, of October. Personnel officer down the county said uh, we have a window opening, opening for people who are eligible to retire, and uh, we have a little extra program we'll give you if you're interested in retiring. I said, when can I retire? And she said, when would you like to retire? I said, tomorrow. <laughs> but it ended up being first. That's good. And so you split your time now? Between Texas in the wintertime, up here in the summertime. And Texas is like a vacation. I go down here and rest all winter. And then come back up around, here. Come back up here and have to put up with you. <laughs> Because you're also active in the Coast Guard as well, right? Yeah. As our operations officer for the division and as the flotilla commander for uh, the Second Iowa Mohawk Flotilla. Um, any reflections, Rich, on, on how your military experience affected your life, <laughs> shaped your opinions? Well, yes. 
personally, I'm probably going to get uh, booed for this, but I believe that every person at the age of 17 or 18 years old that gets out of high school and does not go to college immediately should spend two years in a military organization. The education you get from that, and not just education what you would get in schools, it's the education of the facts of life and how the world runs and everything else. Uh, high school kids today have no idea what is going on in the rest of the world. I say most of them. There may be one out of a thousand that gets a chance to go to another part of the world. And they're lucky if they do. What is going on in the rest of the world that has been for years and years and years people in the United States do not understand at all. Uh, when you have a total annual budget of a hundred dollars, tell that to people, oh no, that can't be. Well, there are people in the world that have less than a hundred dollars a year, or a month, or a year, you know, for, the, for their total income. Because they have to raise all their own vegetables, they have to raise all their own food, and they have to supply their families with whatever they need, with whatever they can do. There are places in the world still today that people live in mud huts, have no sanitary life at all. Some of them get to take a bath once a month in a river or something. Other than that, the, they don't even have good drinking water. And there's a lot of places like that in Asia. How do you how do you think all that figures into our current situation with the Middle East? Oh. <laughs> Let me give you an example of the Middle East. Karachi, Pakistan. Everybody is familiar with Karachi, Pakistan. It's the capital city of Pakistan. They're probably 90% Muslims. They have one of the most beautiful hotels I have ever seen. And it's right on the main street in Karachi. But the last time I was there was probably 64, because I hope I never have to go back there. And you walk out of the front door of this beautiful big hotel, cross the curb onto the street. And when you go from the grass of the hotel front yard, cross the curb onto the street, you cross the open draining ditch that the sewer from the hotel runs into. And so there's a whole different perspective about oh, there is nothing there. I mean, there's there's all kinds of money. Iran was the same place. They had millions and millions of dollars in that country. Oil producing countries. No one had running water. No one had a sewage system. Everything drains into the rivers. And they had a place right outside of Karachi. You had to cross this bridge over the river to go to the airport. And uh, everybody that spoke English referred to that bridge as Breathless Corner because the stench was so bad when you crossed the canal, you could not breathe. So there's money, but, it's not, <laughs> but not everybody has it. No. No. 10% uh, of the people have 99% of the money in the country. Until that is changed a little, we're always going to have people like we're dealing with now, terrorists, whatnot. They have no life. Their life is worthless. They know they have no future. So there's a hopelessness. Rich, in looking back on all this, any parting thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Uh, hope for the better. But the only way this world is going to get better is two reasons. People in the United States that travel abroad project their thoughts to the people out of the United States that the United States is a quiet, peaceful country. 
and because it's a quiet, peaceful country, is because they work together as a team. And uh, the people who have, have all the money don't have all the money like they do in the rest of the world. Everybody here has a decent living, a decent place to live. And if they don't, I would say it's partially their own fault. There are many people that have been brought up in slums, now living good housing, have good jobs, have good educations. The secret to it is having a good education. If uh, by the time of you're 10 years old, you're put in a factory because your hands are small, and your hands are small enough to, s to sew rugs, which they do in the Middle East, uh, that's the end of your, of your education. And you're big enough to have a job, you're big enough to have a job there at the age of eight. And that's the end of your, end of your education. The other, only other education you get is the world of hard knocks. How that's ever going to take place, I do not have the answer to. Don't ever hope to. Well, Rich, thanks for doing the interview. Um, uh, obviously, I had a important 20 years in the, in the military and, and, a, and, a, and a good life of service and so we appreciate uh, you sharing that with us today and again it's uh, it is August uh, 14th uh, 2002 uh, in Latham New York thanks for you're welcome